And how were the audience tonight? They were great. I <laughs> <laughs> Any favourite parts of the audience, Patty? <laughs> <laughs> Any favourite parts, you mean, of their applause? Yeah. <laughs> and their laughter? The Which whole show? The yeah. Oh, the section? <laughs> no, oh, no, I think they were... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was, what do you think, Robbie? I think everybody was literally one of the best actors we've ever, ever had. <laughs> <laughs> um, and can I start by saying, you are on the stage the whole time. I know! <laughs> Is there a little <laughs> role like it where, where, where the role is like this? I mean, my friend said maybe Pierre Gint. <laughs> I think in all of Marinelle's shows, the, she has the main protagonist who never pleases. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I talk, start with the audience? Because um, the, the Tina from the Stephen Sondheim Society said that Stephen thinks of London and New York as his best audiences. Yeah. And when you took the risk with this show, which yeah. we'll talk about, did you think that London would re reject the big changes you made, or did you think they'd accept it? Oh gosh, I don't think you can think like that. You can't really afford to think like that. You just have to do what you think might work. Why did you think those changes, you know, the, the gender changes, would, would work? Um, I didn't. I didn't know that they would. <laughs> never know what it's going to be like, really. You just keep painting away, I suppose. Um, but I, I love the musical, and my business partner, Chris Harper, has always loved the musical. When we set up our own theatre company, he said to me, why don't we do company? And I've tried to do it before, uh, when I was an associate at another theatre. And um, they, I, I, for some reason or other, that never happened. They didn't let me do it. So I, I never really thought about it. But then Chris said, let's do company. And he said, why don't you do it with a female Bobby? Because we were looking for female stories. And he thought of Rosie. And then I looked at the script and worked out, should we change that gender? And we move that around. And if they say that, and it was all George First work, and that's it. Stephen sometimes, so George first wrote a lot of different companies as well as an outline for a film. So we just looked at all of those and put them together and I thought, well actually this could work for now because a 35 year old woman now who's single and she's obviously attractive, we've said in the script that she is, she's got lots of boyfriends and uh, she's obviously got a great career and she's obviously not badly off money wise and she's got loads of friends. But she's thinking that her 35th birthday, the clock is ticking, and so obviously she's thinking maybe she should settle down, maybe she should have kids, and all of her friends have an opinion about her. So when you made change, you had Rosie in mind? Yeah, yeah. Wow, I and mean, it shows, it shows, doesn't it show? Is there anyone in the audience who is 35? <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> is she you? Can I ask? She, you're nodding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so now, and we heard from uh, now, the word now, and I'm so pleased you said now, because this show was written in 1970, Patrick. I mean, and yet the nowness of it, look yeah. at them all, they can't uh, stay here, they should be on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get an energy, it's your return, I should say this is Patrick's return after 25 years to the West. <laughs> To this show, did you feel that you liked the nowness of it? Did you get that what this was change was going to do to this show from 1970? I didn't see it in 1970. I did play this, and I was a student. I just couldn't afford to go to the theater back then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this, this, you know, it's all relative. It was expensive back then. Um, um, I did it once, and I never understood why <coughs> Joanne was predatory when I played the part, mm -hmm. and. Um, and before it was company, it was about Marianne. I wanted to work with Marianne. So I was willing to just, I, I, didn't, I didn't even consider the, the, the gender change or how it would affect anything. I just wanted to work with Marianne, and I wanted to just be Marianne's best <laughs> Sometimes wrote fabulous roles for women, and Ladies Who Lunch, you loved them. 
native to love. I mean, we loved it. Did you get how much we enjoyed the kind of sleaziness of it? <laughs> I have no idea what you mean by that. <laughs> the looseness of it, the, the sadness of it, the happiness of it. Did you feel that it's that, that Did any of you feel it was sleazy? No. No, no I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> well, I'm saying it's not just it's not that I mean it's sleazy, it's the, it's the excitement of it, really. It's, it's a wait, wait, we go from sleazy to excitement. <laughs> think of that at all when I sing that song. Um, if I'm in the moment, which I hope I am, it's, it's a song about a woman who is um, denigrating her class. And she is a member of that class and she's denigrating and why is she doing that? Why is she um, aloof, basically? Why is she putting these women that is you know that are, she grew up with, she was in school with, um, went to their weddings, they went to her weddings. Why is she putting them down? What is wrong with Joanne? And I think that's, you know, at the end, she's in a way defending them. Going, when she says, you know, these women are still survivors, are still, you know, they're still that class, that it's the money class in New York City, it's the East Side women. And they know, what they know is that everybody dies, there's no difference. And then she, so, you know, she applauds them at the end. She wants she wants everyone to to rise in respect for those w women. It's not sleazy. <laughs> 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 The music is, you know, it's Jonathan Tunick with actually David Cullum, but <coughs> John and he paid, you know, great respect to the original uh, orchestrator, uh, Jonathan Tunick. And I think this is a bossa nova, and I don't know where the other one was. It still had that beat. This has more of a beat to it mm -hmm. than the original did. Um, it's a nightclub. Mm. It's a, you know, they're in a nightclub. And you know, what, th in this particular nightclub, it's a discotheque, you know, it's something that, that I used to go to when I was a kid, you know, when, um, and it's, it's not a up, an upscale nightclub that you would see these women in. I had a, someone of this class say to me once, oh, the season doesn't start until Bobby's shorts at the Carlisle. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Americanness of this show. Were, were you daunted by mm. being such an American show, such a New York show, and these references to the Carlisle Club? Because you you seem like you lived in New York when I watched the show. Did you feel a New Yorker on the stage? You know, did you did it rub off on you the energy of the place? I just I think the piece has an energy of its own that rubs off. I mean, my my sister lives in New York, so I've spent a lot of time there. Um, but no, I, I, it's <coughs> I don't necessarily feel New York -y. I just feel like I'm telling the story of a 35 year old woman in a city who's facing a huge challenge and not knowing what's for her or what she should do and who to listen to and ultimately I think really what I'm trying to portray is that you have to listen to what's right for you. It's so interesting, I only did, are you, did you done it? Okay. It's so interesting <laughs> <laughs> that are in New York are not New Yorker. They're people that came yeah. to New York, and so that you know we don't we I don't know if we ever explore that but that was explored with the comp with the uh, individual uh, couple, but New Yorkers. There's uh, I I just met somebody that was actually born and bred in Manhattan, uh, but you don't you don't see that a lot. You see people that come to New York to make it to make it in, whether whether it's in finance or whether it's in whatever. Yeah, uh, they're not from New York, and these people happen to be on the Upper West Side. Maybe some of them on the Upper East Side, who knows, but they're on the Upper West Side. Well, Larry and Joanna are French. And they may not all be native New Yorkers. So what is a New Yorker? Mm. What is a New Yorker? What it It's the time you have and the people you know, and that's, the, that's what I got the big French. I love the, I think it's the second time for me, and I really got the ensemble tonight. I thought these were mm. friends. I love that mm. energy. Do you love the ensemble moments yourself before oh, I them. I have to say, I absolutely adore this piece from start to finish. It is 
utter, utter joy to do. And even Patty and I say every night that we said it tonight. We say it every night we come on stage. We we have that scene at the end, and we look forward to it so much every single night. But in in the truest sense, this show is never the same twice, mm -hmm. and our scene is never ever the same twice. And we still keep like thinking, what? We still like the months and still squeezing stuff out of it. And I think that's what the most gorgeous thing is about spending every night with this amazing cast and crew and, and Marion's fabulous piece is because we are an ensemble, we're an ensemble on stage, off stage, and I've never been in such a happy, happy company who all support each other and without being, you know, we just, we really get on and I think that it helps the production and that shows hopefully when you're sitting in the audience that you can tell that we have such a great time every and twice on a Thursday and Saturday. <laughs> 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 it just feels like a team. It really does. And did you love from Marianne. Yeah, <laughs> always. Uh, Marianne, the, um, one of the critics wrote that uh, if, if you, you could drive a person crazy. It did come over like an Andrew's sister pastiche in the original staging. It, it, and yeah. there's something so joyful about boys. <laughs> who can't get the girl because the girl won't commit. And yes. isn't that so <laughs> <funny? laughs> <laughs> It's such a joyful <laughs> moment, but you must yeah. have seen your whole concept come together in numbers like that, not just that. But I mean, for me, that yeah. was such a joyful moment, I have to say, probably one of my favourite moments. But did it come together for you when you saw it in rehearsal? Did you understand what you were going to make different as you saw it for the first time? Uh, I remember when the boys first learnt that song, do you remember it? And they oh, yeah. sang it by the piano and everybody was sitting. And a lot of the company hadn't heard it and everybody went mad in the room. It was quite a moment because they sang it so beautifully. And uh, it, the, the room just became electrified. And that was the moment when I thought, keep calm, keep calm. <laughs> <laughs> It's only a song, everything's going to be terrible. Keep <laughs> thinking, <laughs> keep working. Yeah, so that was it. But they are such gorgeous boys, those boys. I mean, they're so delicious. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are, though. <laughs> and we did that number so many times, didn't we? We, we changed oh, wow. it and changed it and changed it, that number. It, changed, it was, like, at one point, it was a more from wine sketch. Oh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was like big Ginger Rogers uh, dress yeah. thing for her. There was a lot of physical comedy, I felt, as well, for, for, for the show, for me. I saw it again in that, in that different way. I felt very, you know, just laughing at the physicality of it, the sort of musical chairs nature of it, oh, the yeah. precision of everybody. This is not a show to do with a cold. You know, you've got to well, we do it. We, <laughs> <laughs> we do it with sick and sponge, with cold, we're on it. No, that's what, that's what you have to just get on. Um, one thing that's a character for me that I haven't discussed when we're with such fabulous characters is the set, the stage. Mm. I feel that it is its own <laughs> person. It's quite my friend who I saw it with uh, said that uh, your life is kind of complicated and chaotic as the centre character, but the, the actual set is so precise. It's a sort of, it's an interesting conflict there, but everything's working, it's inch by inch, and it's so funny as well, you know, the, the, the marriage scene, I'm not getting married. Did you feel that you learned something about staging from the magic that happened? Did, did things come together for you that you always knew were going to happen? Um, mm, well, we, we, we storyboarded it, Bonnie and Christy, the designer and I, um, very exactly as to how the boxes were going to move and when they were going to move. Not not how the actors were going to be inside it, but when and how things would move and what would happen if you're not getting married. Um, it really so in advance, the fridge, yeah. the cake. Yeah. Really? Yeah. What kind of a mind you have? <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to, you don't have much time in rehearsals, so you don't have much money, so you have to plan it all ahead. Um, but I suppose we knew that the beast was all inside Bobby's head and sometimes that isn't maybe very clear. So we wanted to make that really clear. So that's why we went from one door into another door into another door and she's going from one thought to another. And um, that's where the Alice in Wonderland idea came from, that she was just kind of falling through these different thoughts. And the whole thing probably takes 
place in about five or ten minutes as she's hiding under the stairs or something while she's listening to everybody at her surprise birthday party. It's so joyful coming through that little door. Um, we've got some questions. I'll just start going through them now. Um, for you, Patty, have you ever considered directing? It's a question from the audience. Yeah, no, I'm not smart enough. I'm not patient. <laughs> <laughs> it's a no. It's a no. <laughs> What do you think Bobby does after blowing out her candles at the end of the show? Where does her life go from there? What choices does she make? Oh, tell us. That would tell be us. telling. No, <laughs> you have to imagine. Do you know, I, I think different things every day. In your dressing room. Yeah, it's my dressing room. Last one. <laughs> well, Patty and Rosalie both, now that you've seen this show, which has changed the way men and women have performed great shows, this one says, are there any particular roles that are already played by men that you would like to claim and play yourself? Is there a role out there? This is a great question. I wish I'd put this in instead of the sleazy question. <laughs> <laughs> really cooking with the questions now. Is there a male role you want? God, I don't cover any roles. There's no point. I literally don't. I just, I can't. You know, I mean, I'm just, I don't think like that. I mean, if, unless you said come and play right. this, I mean, I've never even thought it would be possible. I also think it, 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 I, I, I went through a period where I auditioned for parts and I didn't get them and there was great depression. So now I'm at the stage in my life and my career that the right thing comes in. And so I don't stress um, about a role I didn't get. I just, I'm overjoyed of, of, with the roles that do come in. And I think if, you're any, if there are any actors out there, think of it that way. You're not losing something, that there is a, there is a destiny in your career. And it just helps. If it, it helps that you're not so depressed all the time. <laughs> so you have in common that you've taken risks. You've originated so many roles, Patty. And you're famous, Rosalie, for taking risks your, with your career. You're not someone who's looking for a hit. And you have in common as well, you've stayed warhorse, all these very, uh, very brave, and, and, and you've all started things. Is there something about originating and um, making something for the first time which is sort of addictive? Because it does carry a po possibility of failure with it, but it also <laughs> brings the team spirit together. Do you feel that an origination is good for a company? I, the I, I personally feel everything you do should feel very original. I mean, I was brought up in the theatre because my parents and grandparents and great grandparents were in the theatre and so there was a huge part of my teenage years where I thought it was the most boring thing ever in the world because <laughs> I was dragged to the theatre and I think that's been hugely motivating for me because everything you do should be life changing, it should have a, a major life force behind it even if it's a classic that's been done 50 million times, you, the theatre is ephemeral, it's about now and it's about how you communicate with the audience there and then and You've got something to say, do it now, do it interestingly, do it excitingly, say it with meaning. What is it about sometimes writing that makes this production still fresh, do you think? This is a question from our audience tonight, for you, Marianne. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Whose well, question was it? Well, the thing is, I suppose George first <laughs> who wrote the, 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 the scenes, um, in lots of ways, his writing is, is quite ahead of its time because when we were working on this I sort of felt it was it had it, it reminded me of things like Friends mm. which my daughter is watching over and over and over and over <laughs> and also Sex and the City I was reminded of some comedy in there and the quips and the energy behind the lines um, but sometimes I feel like he's so he's so uh, emotional in the way that he, he writes you know, he writes or the psychology of his characters in the way the songs are formed and structured, <coughs> that that's quite universal and quite timeless. I think. And I also think that, that, that you concentrated a lot on the script, and that doesn't happen in musicals. Uh, generally, the scripts aren't that good, and then <laughs> they are, and then, and then you know, they're generally just written to promote a song, but then George wrote a great script, and, and, and you investigated that script. So that it's we're, it's a play. It's more like a play with music, I think, that we think of it. And it is fresh. George, George, I don't think when they did this originally that the script was rehearsed as as uh, deeply 
um, mind as deeply as you mind it. This was at a very unusual rehearsal process for me because the, the music took third place. It was the script. It was side by side in company. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was the music. And it was up to us to know, that, you know, to learn the music. But usually in a musical situation, it's music. And the script gets shafted a lot of the time. And not in this case. And I think that makes a huge difference. Because we're all marveling at the great script George wrote. We spent, I mean, I remember just Saturday after Saturday, we'd come in and spend hours. I mean, we just didn't even get up for maybe four weeks. We were talking about. No, we did, we did. That particular we spent a lot of time talking oh, about it. And I think it's really crucial in a musical because if you don't, um, if you don't have that kind of um, comprehension, if it's a, if it's a if it's a well-made musical, if you don't have the comprehension of this of the scene that is in front of the song, then there's a disconnect. There's just a disconnect, and you go, "Oh, what a great song!" and you don't think about the scene. And in this particular case, it's all it's all integrated. Yeah. In, in, in such a way that that we 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 are excited by it. We yeah. it keeps we're fresh in it every night. Because there's some musicals you adopt the brace position when they're about to start singing, exactly. and you can't explain it, and you know the number in advance. But so uh, here it's, it's it's sort of seamless, and, and we do you know why that happened? Did it, uh, do you know how that came about? <laughs> <laughs> You know, the, the way that second act just cranks up and cranks yeah. up and cranks up and cranks up. That, that's really a structure. Um, the music, I, it's a, we should talk about the amazing uh, musical performance we've enjoyed as well as everything we've seen from you. And to, ha to have the, the, the orchestra above, mm. did that bring challenges? Was that something that worked at, at, at straight away? Oh, it did bring challenges because it was very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't afford it, we went over budget. Uh, it wobbled a lot. <laughs> they got rained on. They do have big expenses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so apart from that, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, 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 seriously, we did really want the audience to be seen, uh, the, sorry, the, the orchestra to be seen. <coughs> We're stopping it down here and you don't know where the musicians are. And they're picked with such care and love by Joel Fram and it's been orchestrated so beautifully and they are a major part of the show um, so we wanted it to be clear where they were and who they were. Like the character as well. Yeah. Um, many of us are wondering what would have happened if Stephen Sondheim had disagreed with you. Hmm. <laughs> 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 about him is that he's written a lot of lots of musicals and musicals <coughs> are inherently a collaborative experience. Because if you're writing a musical, you can't just do your own thing. You've got so many other things to think about. You've got to think about the book writer, you've got to think about the director, you've got to think about the audience, you've got to think about how to structure it, how to get everybody up on their feet or whatever it is. And um, you'll be writing all the time in previews. So he's somebody who is understanding that the collaborative or the, the creative experience has its pitfalls. And you're allowed to fail and you're allowed to try. Um, what was really lucky was that he'd seen a production I'd done of St. Joan at the National. And he'd, he happened to really like it. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> got me in the door. So I went, went to his house and talked to him over his dinner table. <laughs> 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 Well, and what was the story about Captain Hepburn? 
Yeah. <laughs> 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 Cassie, what kind of West End have you returned to? You mentioned this is not like you've been away, but to 25 years and to, to have all that experience, what's the health of it, what's the vitality of it? You've already praised this audience tonight. But what kind of reflections have you had on the city that you... Well, you, you know, it's, I, don't, I think audiences are the same all over the place if you're delivering something. And, you know, we all feel the same way. We've, got, we've all got red blood. Some of us have blue blood. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much we all have red blood. And so we all, I think, respond the same way. We're all, and if you do a really good production, it becomes a community, and it, you know, an individual experience in a communal environment. I, I'm so blown away that there's so many young people in the theater, considering the price of a ticket. And that's the same thing in, in New York, but the, it's twice as expensive in New York, but there's a lot of young people in the theater, which will keep the theater alive, will just really keep the theater alive. I resent, completely resent the fact that at least in New York it's turned into Love of Vegas. Do you know what I mean? It's become more and more about these gigantic musicals that will sit in theaters for years. There should be a term limit on Supreme Court judges. <laughs> 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 And musicals and theaters, because, because they are, you know, they're, they're holding up theaters, and you're not seeing, you know, new. And I know young audiences would want to see new playwrights and new composers and lyricists. And I, I you know, I, as far as what I think is different, I don't think that way. I don't, you know, I just sort of go out there and go and hope I'm doing a good job. And if I, if I get, if I get a response, then it's no different than anything that was 21 years, 22 years. 23 years ago, yeah. hopefully. Well, we can, we can put that to the test if you like. But it's been so fabulous just watching the three of you tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to get, get move to the final few questions. If you've got one for me, you can catch my eye. But I've just got to, to ask you, Patty, another one from the floor here. Uh, why do you think it is that Joanne offers her husband Larry to Bobby? Because Marianne told me. <laughs> Joanne must be incredibly insecure and to, con to keep control of the situation, she offers her husband before her husband leaves her. And everyone's nodding here. Makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what I'm playing. I'm playing, you know, I see them embrace in the, in the discotheque. He's younger than I am and he. I torture him, clearly. And <laughs> <laughs> my husband too. <laughs> and, and, and and you know, it's it's for her to say, I gave him away as opposed to he left me. There's so much conflict in the show, freedom and security, love and kind of that the line when you people get on your nerves. There's so much for you to work with, and it's really had, all of us had such a great time, thanks to you. Um, is there anything you want to say to each other? It's not often done in a Q&A. <laughs> 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 but we're, we're going to draw it to a close. Oh, I can write. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow, I just feel so lucky to have worked with both of them. Ditto. Fortunately, <laughs> Rosie was in a show of mine, The Lights of Suffering, she spent half of the first, well, the first half on a wire, and then, oh, I'm being puppeteered. And then the second half she was in meant to be in a lake, so that was easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to talk to Patty again. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you about who you're on stage with, what this has meant to you, because it's, you know, we don't often hear you say things in your own... In my own voice? Yeah. Oh, I think <laughs> I said it earlier, just about, this is just genuinely just been the job of a lifetime. To work with Marianne again, I'm going to just literally walk over the hot coals to, to work with her. I mean, she's the best. She paid me lots of money. No. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get paid. She just... just, 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 just Patty? Um, it's the best experience. It's the happiest I've been on stage, and um, it's the most content I've been in my life because I'm well taken care of by the producer, and I'm well taken care of by my director. And I, as Rosie said earlier, 
this is a um, very unique experience for a group of actors to get together and play and then just like each other. And so we're, we're very, we're very happy. I, 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 I'm, it's coming to an end and it's devastating me every single day. It's when another day is gone, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know. What I'm gonna, I don't You're know. You're not what leaving. Do. Well, I, <laughs> it's it's you know it's it's shows come to an end, and they're when heartbreaking. When did they come to an end? Thirty. End of March. End of March. Oh, but then Corliss is going to the National. You've risk, you've helped spark uh, new interest in. There's a question. You say it with your eyes or speak very loud. <laughs> uh, Patty, this past Thursday, due to the unfortunate illness of Rosie and her understudy. You came out graciously and sang an incredible finale, if you will. We'd like to know what that song was. It's, uh, it's called A Hundred Years From Today, and it's a Tin Pan Alley song. Mm -hmm. so a Hundred Years From Today. It's a great, it's got a great sentiment, doesn't it? Yeah, it's all fabulous. Thank yeah. you. I wish I'd heard it. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Shout out very loudly. Hello. Um, I just wanted to know, both of you two, um, to speak how happy you are within your role and off stage. What is the gap between that? How do you go from, you know, Bobby or Joanne, and then the next day keep it fresh to meet your characters again? Training. <laughs> <laughs> trust Rosie implicitly. I know that, that she will see and accept everything that I do within you know the confines of the, the part. But I do believe, firmly believe, that you need to train to be an actor. And if you train to be an actor, then you know what you're doing. You know, you put your makeup on, you set your foot on the stage, and you do it. But it takes training. Ladies and gentlemen, we've enjoyed this time very much. Thank you very much.